Hello and welcome. My name is James Norton and this is an introduction to Continuum, a closure development extension for Visual Studio Code. I'm going to show you how to get started with a toy project and explore some of the features. In upcoming demos, I will work on more sophisticated projects and go more in depth on the Continuum workflow. To begin with, let me show you how to install the extension. To get started, you will need to have Visual Studio Code installed and of course, Clojure. You will also need to have Linegan installed as it is used internally by the extension although you do not need to use it in your project. Finally, you need to have the Java JDK installed with the tools.jar file. This jar file provides a Java debug interface that is used by the Clojure debugger. It typically resides under the lib directory of your Java installation. If you're developing Clojure, you probably already have all these installed, so I'm not going to cover them here. Once you have all the requirements on your system, there are several ways to install Continuum. But the easiest is just to start up Visual Studio Code and go to the extensions view list. From there, you can search the marketplace for Continuum and install it. This should take just a few seconds. After installing it, reload the editor window and you're ready to go. I'm going to use Line again to create a simple library project. Once the project opens up, you should see the closure extension active message down in the status bar. Now before we can actually use any of the functions of the extension, we need to set up a couple things. The first thing we need to do is to make sure that the debug middleware gets loaded when the extension starts out. An easiest way to do this is to create a profiles.clj file and add a profile that loads that middleware. So we create a debug REPL profile here, and it's important to remember this because we're going to use it again later. And we set up our resource path to include a path to the tools.jar file. Now this is going to be different for your environment than it is for mine. And then we set REPL options to include the debug middleware, and then we list the debug middleware in our dependencies. Okay, once we have the profiles at CLJ set up, we need to do one more thing. We need to tell Visual Studio Code how to launch our REPL. And the way we do this is we go to the debug pane and we click on the little gear icon here to create what's called a launch configuration or launch.json file. When we click on that, we choose closure debug for the environment and it'll create a default launch.json file. Now this file tells Visual Studio Code exactly how we want to start up our REPL. It tells it how, what the command line should be, what the environment variable should be, and basically everything it needs to, to work. And we can have multiple configurations defined with the launch.json file. In this case, the default configuration is almost right for us. We just have to change two different things. We have to specify the absolute path to line again. And here, notice it already has by default debug REPL profile is going to be used when the REPL starts up. So we can leave that alone. If we had used a different profile name, we obviously we would have to change this here. Uh, the other thing we have to do, the line path is set up correctly, but the other thing we have to do is set up our tools.jar path. In this case, this works a lot because this tends to be where it lives if you have Java home set, but in my case, that's not set up. So I'm going to go ahead and specify the proper path here. Now everything else is set up correctly for me. The defaults all work. There's different ports you can set that will change how things run but for the sample project, this is good enough. One thing I want to talk about, though, is uh, there's a request parameter here to find how the REPL is going to start up. Launch means it's going to actually start its own REPL, and that's what this command line is for. The other option is to, do, is to use attach, in which case, if you have a REPL that's already running and you want to attach to it and debug it and interact with it, you can set this to attach, and that'll, that'll work, in which case you wouldn't have a command line option here. The other thing I want to point out is you can specify where this REPL is going to start up. And it can start up in one of three places. It can either start up in the Visual Studio Code integrated terminal, it can start up in an external terminal, or it can run in a separate process which is displayed in the debug console. That's the way I usually like to use it because it makes things a little bit simpler. But you may sometimes want to use a terminal because your code expects to run in a terminal or because it expects you to enter input. 
Okay, now that we have our profile set up and we have our launch configuration set up, we're ready to go. Normally, the way you would launch a debug session in Visual Studio Code is to click on the gear icon here and then pick a launch configuration. That's not how you start the REPL up in Continuum. In order to start the REPL, we open the command palette and type REPL and then choose Closure Start REPL. And then we choose a launch profile. In this case, we only have one. So we'll go ahead and select that. Now, as the debugger is starting up, you'll see this blue line moving back and forth indicating that the debugger is launching. And you'll see starting debugger down here in the status code. While this is launching, this will take a few seconds here. It can take a lot longer for a large closure project. Let's talk a little bit about the debug window. The variable section is where you'll see all the variables when you hit a breakpoint. The watch section is where you would see watch variables. Unfortunately, watch variables are not supported right now by Continuum. The call stack lists all the threads that are running in your REPL. And when you stop on one, you'll see all the frames of that given stack. And then the different breakpoints you set will show up here on the breakpoint list. And as things are starting up here, we can show the debug console. The first time you run Continuum, you're going to see a bunch of dependencies loaded. This will only happen on the very first run. As the REPL is starting up, you'll see this blue line moving back and forth indicating the debug session is starting. And you'll see starting debugger down here in the status bar. You can see the REPL has actually started up already, and what's happening is the debugger is connecting to it in the background. Okay, once the debugger connects to the REPL, you'll see the status bar turn orange, and you'll see attached to process in the, in the status. Okay, now we're ready to start programming closure. So let's go to our core.clj file and look at some of the features of the extension. The first thing you'll notice is that when you hover over a bar, you see the doc string printed out. And this works for core closure functions or any functions you define that are loaded into your REPL. The next thing you'll notice is that as you're typing, you get a list of completions. One other feature that Continuum offers is auto formatting. So you can either right click and format the entire document, or if you've selected code, you can right click and format just the selection. Another feature that Continuum offers is the ability to right click on a bar and either peek at a definition or go to a definition. If we peek at a definition, a little mini window will pop up and it'll show you the code defining that bar. In this case, it's actually unjarred the jar file containing the core closure libraries, and we can see the source code from that. And we can actually go to that if we want. If, if we right-click again and select Go to Definition, it'll actually unjar that jar file and jump the editor to that position in the code. Now going back to our core.clj file here, we know that line again is defined the test for us, so let's go ahead and execute that. So we bring up our command palette, type test, and here we have an option of running all the tests in the whole project, running the test under the cursor, or running tests in the current namespace. We'll go ahead and run all tests since we're not in the test namespace right now. And when we do that, we see the test failed as expected. Now before we go ahead and go to that test, let me show you how to execute code. There's three different ways you can execute code with the extension. The first way is to execute it directly in the currently open editor. So let's go ahead and add a comment line here and call our function. Before we do that, we need to refresh our code, and we can do that from the command palette. So this will reload all the files that have been modified. So now we can go ahead and execute our function, and we have a helper that makes it easier to execute code within the editor. Shift Command M will select the next outer form, and you can keep hitting Shift Command M to keep selecting further and further out. So we'll go ahead and select this form and hit Command Alt E or Control Alt E on Linux, and we can see down in the REPL the output from the execution. If our console starts getting cluttered up with output, we can click on the Clear Console icon to clear it. Now, the second way to execute code with the extension is to type it directly into the input box for the debug console. Now the difference between these two 
is that when you execute code from within an editor, it executes in the namespace of that open editor. When you execute code from within the input box of the debug console, it executes in the user namespace. So you can see if we try and call our function from within this input box, it's not going to work because that's not defined within the user namespace. Now the third way to execute code in Continuum is to execute code in the input box when you're at a breakpoint. And I'll talk about that more when we talk about debugging in a moment. For right now, let's go back to our broken test. So let's go ahead and open up that file and take a look. That's pretty obvious what the problem is here. This test is designed to fail. But let's go ahead and pretend that we don't know what it is. So we need to figure out why this is is failing. So if we hover over equals here, we see, so if we hover over equals here, we see that equals returns true if the arguments are equal and false if they're not. So let's go ahead and test that. Once again, we use shift control M to select the form and then we execute it with command alt E. And as expected, we see it returns false. So we can fix this and we'll go ahead and change our doc string here as well. And now we're going to rerun the test. Now, normally, if you're going to re-execute code, you'll either need to redefine it by selecting the entire form and hitting Command-Alt-E, or you can refresh code. But by default, when you run tests, any code that is changed gets refreshed and reloaded. So we can go ahead and just simply run our test again. In this case, we'll just run tests in the namespace. And we see that the test passed. So let's go back to our core side CLJ file. And let's talk about debugging. The primary thing you do when you're debugging is to set breakpoints and look at vars at those breakpoints. So we'll go ahead and set a breakpoint now by clicking on the gutter here to the left of the print line statement. And we can go ahead and call this bar function again. Remember, shift control M. And we'll go ahead and execute it and we'll stop the breakpoint. Now if we look over here at the list of variables, we see there are no locals defined and see the one argument x. And if we look down here in the call stack, we see that our REPL worker 5 thread is paused on breakpoint at line 6 of core.clj. And we see all the stack frames leading up to that. And we can go ahead and execute code and access the vars defined at this point. So we can say square x, and we see the result here in the debug console. But let's go ahead and continue this. Let's move on just a little bit from here. Let's go ahead and add a new local variable here. And we'll make it twice x. You notice that the breakpoint is grayed out here. The reason for this is because our code is in an unsafe state and we haven't refreshed it. The unfortunate thing about debugging under Clojure is that Clojure lines do not translate one for one to Java bytecode. This is particularly true when you're talking about macros. So you pretty much have to use trial and error when you're trying to set breakpoints. Basically, if you click on a breakpoint and it stays grayed out, it means the extension wasn't able to set that breakpoint. So you need to remove that breakpoint and try and move it somewhere else. In this case, the breakpoint is grayed out because our code isn't saved. And so we need to save it and refresh it. We can go ahead and do that. And now the breakpoint gets reestablished. Every time you refresh your code, the breakpoints will get reset, and the ones that are able to be reset will return. So let's go ahead and execute our code. And now that we're at the breakpoint, we see we have a new local var, 32, and our argument x is still here. So this pretty much covers the basic features of the Continuum extension for Visual Studio Code. Please give it a try and let me know what you think of it. Ratings in the Visual Studio Code marketplace are always appreciated, and if you find bugs or if there are features you would like added, please file issues on the GitHub page. In later demos, I'll look at more sophisticated closure projects and talk a little bit more about my overall workflow with Continuum. Thank you for watching.